Hey YouTube, Tactical Channel 762 here. Um, I've had this for probably over a little bit now, but uh, this was a gun show find about two month, about a month ago actually. Um, this is a Type 99 Arasaka made in 1942 at the Tokyo Kurukyo Arsenal in well, Tokyo, Japan. Um, according to the person I bought the rifle from, this rifle's been sitting in a closet for many, many decades. And, uh, supposedly it was captured at Okinawa. So, that's kind of cool. It's a, uh, it's not a last-ditch rifle by any means, but it is missing most of the extras. It still has a heavy metal butt plate instead of a wood butt plate. It still has a, a machined mum on the back of the striker. The, uh, it still has the full ladder sight for the rear, although it has no anti-aircraft sights, it has no dust cover on the action, no monopod, and no cleaning rod. Although it might have had a cleaning rod at one point, it, it doesn't have it anymore. Could have been lost, could have been any number of things. But uh it does have to what it does have what I believe is a matching bayonet. This is a Japanese type 30 sword bayonet. And this is this pattern is correct for this year of rifle. This is a Tokyo Kukyo Arsenal as well to my knowledge. So um these rifles are chambered in seven seven well seven point seven by fifty eight millimeter which is a full-size bottleneck cartridge that can be formed off of 30-06. Uh, these rifles, according to Hatcher's notebook, are the strongest action of any World War II rifle. Julian Hatcher tested the Arasaka Type 99 to 30, uh, I'm sorry, 90,000 PSI for multiple rounds, and it was the only World War II rifle, to my knowledge, that he was not able to get to have a significant failure. Long story short, this is the only rifle Julian Hatcher, the guy known for blowing up guns, has never blown up. This is one of the only ones, and to my knowledge, the only World War II service rifle. Uh, the actions are immensely strong. The cartridge is slightly more powerful than the German 8mm Mauser. These are dummy rounds I have formed off of off of 30 out 6 brass. I don't know if that'll pick it up. But that is 30, Winchester 30 out 6 brass. I've got some pulled bullets from Steel Core ammo from my Mosins. The reason why I did that was because I had these bullets pulled already because I needed cases for head spacing, firing pin protrusion, checking, various just random purposes. So I had a few of these projectiles laying around and they both clock at 312 diameter so I was able to make some dummy rounds. I have formed some lead lead bulleted ammo for this rifle off of 30-06 brass using 40 grains of IMR 4895 powder. 
Uh, I have yet to shoot this rifle, but this is this isn't really a uh, shooting review. This is just an overall look at a Japanese Arasaka in general. The uh, the action is based on the Mauser 98, although it is not a true Mauser 98 action. There is a full-length claw extractor. It has a backup lug, along with two main locking lugs, although the front faces on these locking lugs are curved. The, uh, the air socket uses an injector box. It uses a flush fit double stack magazine. It uses a last round bolt hole zipping feature, which when the rifle is out of ammo, it prevents the bolt from going forward until the follower is depressed, which would mean the rifle's been loaded again. This rifle, like the Mauser, has gas venting holes, except the Type 99 has a gas venting hole out the top of the receiver, while the Mauser 98 has holes on the bottom of the bolt venting into the magazine in case of a cartridge rupture. Unlike most service rifles other than the Lee Enfield of the era, this is a cock on close action, meaning that when you open the bolt, all of the all of the force of the uh, of the mainspring is is reduced. Basically, you can see the camming surfaces in there. This surface stays stuck on the sear, and then when it locks into action, locks into battery, the surface is suspended on the sear over this notch, which allows it to have this area of movement. When your sear drops, it's able to snap forward in this in this camming surface, which is what makes this a cock and close. If you notice, the gun wants to stop here, so you have to push with a fair amount of force and then rotate it closed. Uh, most actions of this era are a cock on open. Cock on, uh, cock on close is said to be less, less desirable than a cock on open rifle. Honestly, I don't think it really matters all that much. It, it's more of a preference reasons. It seems like the cock on open is kind of the action that still survives today though. The uh, These rifles use a lightweight hardwood and all around these rifles are just designed to be rifles used for jungle combat. You can see there is a space over here to allow water out of the action to this low point on the stock where there is a drainage hole. There's also a drainage hole up here. This rifle is designed to keep moisture out. The uh, This action disassembles much like a Mauser 98 or even as early as a Mauser 1888. You open the action, pull your bolt to the rear, open your ejector box, bolt comes out. Then you put your palm on the back of the striker, push in, and you rotate it about a, about a quarter turn. Your striker then comes off and honestly you could just stare into that for a long time. That's just that's just extremely high levels of machining. That's that's some advanced check on right there. So uh, this is one of your serialized components if you're wondering. This rifle is an all matching rifle. And it also oh, also still retains the mum on the receiver. Then uh this just fell out, but this was sitting in the action. After you remove your striker, 
You pull this out, which is your firing pin. Your mainspring comes out, and that is a field stripped Type 99 Arasaka bolt. If you want to remove your extractor, what you do is you take it, you rotate it so it's in line with your bolt handle. You press down here and you push forward. And your extractor is removed. Uh, this is basically identical to a Mauser 98 extractor. To reassemble, you align your extractor with this bolt ring groove. Press down and return to that notch. Then you rotate it flat with your locking lugs with your, uh, well, kind of your, almost you could say your bottom lug. Uh, you take your firing pin after that, slide it in, mainspring, then you make sure this tab is facing up like your extractor is. Insert it, rotate it, and your bolt is reassembled. Then you can slide that back into the way. By the way, by depressing the trigger, that's your sear, which is what cams on this surface, allowing the rifle to fire. So to reinsert it, it's pushed forward and it goes right in. To use the safety on these rifles, what you need to do is push in and rotate. This notch faces upwards when the safety is on. The trigger is not, on, not operational. The bolt is not operational. Locks out the whole rifle. Take the safety off, just the reverse, push in, rotate. Now, your rifle is usable again. These rifles use a ladder sight that is graduated out to 1500 meters. There, on the earlier war rifles, there would be a set of folding down anti-aircraft wings, which were designed to shoot at early war spotter aircraft, more honestly, more aircraft for the 1930s. Um, they're measured in one, two, and three hundred nautical kilometers per hour, to my knowledge. Uh, this site has, it's a ladder site adjustable up to 1500 meters, as I said, it just slides up and down on the main rail. The bottom of the site has a notch zeroed at 200 meters. The site set all the way to the bottom is at 300, and the site folded down with this aperture is also 300. The front sight is a a pyramid or barley corn style site with protective ears and it is driftable inside of a dovetail with a punch and hammer. The sling attachment points there is one back here on the buttstock which attaches to the rifle by two screws and there is one up here on the rear barrel band. The handguard is held in by this rear barrel band. A pin going under the rear sight, which you don't have to drive this out, this just slides forward. And by this front nose cap, which acts as what holds your handguard on. There is a hole for your cleaning rod up front and it acts as your bayonet lug. The Japanese Type 30 bayonet simply locks onto 
the rifle from the muzzle, just going backwards, just like a Mauser bayonet. To remove it, you depress this button and slide it forward. Uh, this rifle, speaking about the sling, has a reproduction uh, air socket sling. And. Oh, yeah, there's nothing much more to say about that sling. Uh, authentic slings, slings run around $350, so you don't see too many of those, nor do too many people want to pay that much for them. This rifle is all numbers matching, made at the Tokyo Kukyo Arsenal. And you can see this rail cut into the receiver, and that would be originally for a dust cover, which this rifle is missing. Basically trying to save on machining time. It's a five round flush fit magazine, as I had said. And to open the magazine from the bottom, you use this little latch inside of the trigger guard. You pull that rearward, and this opens up. Then your rounds will fall out the bottom. And if you want to get the spring out of the way, you simply pull it back, it locks into that notch right there. No, it doesn't lock, it just slides in. To return it, you need to guide your follower in, and then it snaps shut. Uh, if you are inspecting one of these rifles, there are a few things you want to look for. You want to look for the extras, which are dust cover, the anti-aircraft sights, the monopod, and the cleaning rod. Most of the rifles won't have them, only the very early rifles will. You want to make sure it has an intact mum if you can. Most of these rifles do not have an intact mum. This one's a little beaten over. It's not defaced completely, it's just not as crisp as most of them are. Most of the good ones are. Most of the time, these things would be peened out, ground off. Basically, when these rifles were surrendered, they removed that mark as a property of the Emperor. Um, some of the late war rifles will have a wooden butt plate. Those rifles aren't worth as much as ones with a heavy steel machined cut, uh, cupped butt plate. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. When you inspect the bore on one of these rifles, if it looks like the rifling edges are worn over, that is completely normal. This does not use Enfield rifling like most rifles do. It uses Metford rifling, which has rounded edges. Also, if you look at the muzzle, you can see a chrome ring around it. This is how you can tell it's an earlier war rifle. By 1945, they were not using, you would not see that chrome ring. Basically what that means is that this rifle has a chrome round lined barrel. The reason why they would chrome line the barrels is because rust prevention. As I said, these rifles were made for a island hopping, moist, moist environment nation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I'll try to put out more videos soon. I'll try to get videos of of us shooting this. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Tactical Channel 762 out. See ya.